Laura Palka is the founder and CEO of Trade Show Solutions Center, a leading provider of exhibit planning, design, production, and marketing services for the past 20 years. A respected and highly sought after firm, Trade Show Solutions Center provides planning and execution for businesses of all sizes. Laura's skills in sales, marketing, and branding, coupled with her insight into her clients and their needs, has led to the company's success. Laura is also a partner at nnspromo.com, providing visual communications to businesses to help them grow and prosper. Welcome to Eventus 365, the podcast that's all about corporate events and the magic behind the scenes. I'm your host, Yannick DaCosta, and I am excited to take you on a journey through the world of corporate events. But before we dive in, let's talk about the stress of creating marketing material for your events. We all know how tough it can be when deadlines are tight and resources are limited, but guess what? YKMD Visual Communications has got your back. Our design firm specializes in working with corporate event professionals just like you, and we're here to help take the stress out of creating stunning graphics for your event. Our team of expert designers can deliver custom brand compliant designs in just 12 hours. So whether you need branding, signage, marketing materials, or anything else, YKMD's got you covered. Okay, now that that's done, let's start the show. Laura, how are you? It's been a while since we chatted. Yes, and it's so good to see you. Always, I, I love having the opportunity to be able to, to talk with you and share information and ideas. Awesome sauce. So congratulations on being nominated for um, 100 Most Influential People in the Event Industry. Like, What do you think sets you apart from the others in the uh, events industry? So I think that... Um... I think the work that that really uh, prompted that nomination was uh, the work that I'm doing with uh, the National Trade Show Alliance, which is going to be renamed this month to the Exhibition and Events Workforce Development Federation. Okay. And I took my uh, experience in in fundraising and nonprofits and in HR. Uh, I went to school to um, at the Harry Van Ardsdale School of Labor Studies in New York City. And so it, it was a culmination of a lot of different um, experiences and, and the steps that we take along the way to develop our careers that um, helped me to open that door and to really uh, find a way that we could connect support and develop our workforce the boots on the ground gotcha uh so, but you also own other companies like um the trade show solution center so how did the trade show solution center get started <laughs> so i have been in the industry for um over 30 years I I was told that you stop saying that after twenty five. But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who says? Who says that? I feel like I feel like that person probably was have not been in the industry for over thirty years, and they can't say it, so they don't. Oh, around that. <laughs> there you go. So, um, I I actually uh, started in the industry, and I was really really fortunate to learn from artisans. To, um, from second and third generation uh, a graphic design and exhibit builders. And uh, they were, uh, their father had started in the World's Fair, um, right in Queens and in building the World's Fair and making history uh, at that time. And then they began uh, to build exhibits and, and really it was like the fortune, only the fortune 500 could be in trade shows at that time, but it was truly an, an incredible training opportunity to learn so much about the importance of brand, the importance of quality, the importance of some of the formalities that were not only here in the US, but we did a lot of work in Milan. I did some work uh, 
for companies out of uh, Venice and London and uh, Germany. So it's international. It's, uh, yes, I I was at 30 years old. I'll never forget getting on a, a plane, flying to Milan and then getting on Lufthansa to scoot over to Germany. And I went, whoa, look at this. I'm a jet setter. <laughs> But that uh, that started me in this this amazing world of visual communications, and I drank the Kool Aid. I am I am so excited to still be in this business and to help companies to grow, and to help them build their programs, and to uh, help see the results of this amazing work. So I mean, uh, okay, Miss Globetrotter. Um, how, how do you think that the events industry has evolved in the past 20 years? And like, what are some of the biggest changes that you've seen that really stand out to you? The first one was the portable modular, uh, world when, when we started to be able to have prefabricated parts that were a certain size, and then you could design and build almost like Legos or Lincoln logs. Mm -hmm. So uh, that that brought the price down a bit on the custom construction. Not to say that you wouldn't have a custom design made out of those prefabricated pieces. But it, it really, uh, when I first started in the industry, you went and you interviewed a client and you you had a designer create this rendering by hand and you went and you pitched it and then you estimated on what it would cost to build it because there was no two alike. Every single design was a unique design and everything from Toy Fair on Fifth Avenue in New York City to the jewelry show when it was at the Javits Center uh, to PC Expo, uh, the garment industry was huge, huge at the Javits Center with International Kids Fashion Week and and all of the shows that led up to Magic in Vegas. So, you know, it was it was it was a very it was a very sexy industry because everything was coming off the R&D pipeline. It was new, it was innovative mm -hmm. and um, it was big, 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 big. And now uh, with the with the introduction of Portable Modular, it opened up the floor to smaller companies where uh, someone could take with a budget of $15,000 or $20,000, have a respectable presence on the show floor and really be introduced to some of those buyers that were catering to, to only the top echelon. And the next was, uh, I see the same thing happening with technology. The pandemic caused all of us to, you know, reinvent ourselves and find other ways to communicate. And so the hybrid event, the virtual event, the webinar, the uh, the use of technology uh, has come down in price. More alternatives are available for companies of every size to get involved in utilizing the technology to expand their reach, to get more bang for their buck, to be able to enhance. And we've been doing that, let me not kid you, for 30 years. I mean, CA had CA TV. Uh, that's computer associates, symbol technologies was using mobile trailers uh, to deliver their message from coast to coast and and give a more um, get to the those out of secondary markets, I would say secondary markets and those uh, facilities and buyers that were outside of the convention center geography. So but but the cost of it was not not tenable for the small business. Now with the Zoom and with other technologies, Invent, VFairs, or Invent and VFairs, uh, and some others that are coming down the pipeline, that there's opportunity to uh, to take your live event on the show floor and, and kick it up a notch, uh, expand your presence. And then the last, I think, is social media. 
you know, it's no longer a fad. It's now an integrated part of, of everyone's marketing communication plan. And now you'll see that a company will design a mobile trailer or a mobile exhibit and they'll drive it to the show and move it onto the show floor all along building that story and, and the interaction through social media with their clients, their customer base, um, and stopping for some, uh, for some demos along the way or focus groups and various other things that you can use uh, to hospitality events to, to really kick your, your program to a much higher level. I feel like everything that you just said kind of lends itself to us as a society wanting to create access, access to the companies, access to the potential customers. It's all about evolving to a place of like accessibility. And I, I almost, I almost find it, I don't know, it's almost, I don't, I don't know. It's almost a little ironic for me because like historically, like, events industry has like struggled with like diversity and inclusion right like so with all of this like trying to create all of this accessibility for like these different companies and these different people I feel like that's a really great like pivoting point to kind of find out like how like how has how have your companies like taken steps to promote like DEI in its work like I mean, because you work with a lot of people within the industry. So whether it's through uh, the Trade Show Solution Center or, um, you know, NTSA, which is, you know, soon to be renamed, like how have you been trying to promote that message or have you at all? So that's a big, big question. And, uh, and it's, and it, but it's a great question because I think that, for so many, for decades, everybody is just, well, let me just say it this way. I I reached a point in my life where I went, oh my God, I'm just being fat, dumb and happy and I'm not paying attention to anything. And um, I think that that hit us in a, in a very profound way um, as we stopped during the pandemic and we settled and we paused and we started to really immerse ourselves in our culture, in our activities, in really looking at our purposefulness or lack thereof. And so I, I think that the biggest step that we've undertaken is become present. So we know that there's, there is a an issue there is a concern there is this thing the d you know the dei um and what does it mean and how can we be inclusive i know that one of the things that i just experienced and and i'm using my platform to talk about it is um uh, the handicap i mean you know, they're now motorized wheelchairs. Mm -hmm. And I was in a in a state and going to a convention center and I knew there was a difference because I had to make arrangements for air travel. You know, it's not a wheelchair, it's a motorized wheelchair. Can you accommodate it? And there was a special communication. And then we were looking at, you know, well, what about the transport from the airport to the hotel? And I specifically called and said, do you have capacity for a motorized wheelchair? Oh, yes, we have one shuttle without and one shuttle with for the wheelchairs. Mm -hmm. my, my photographer who is in that motorized wheelchair landed in the airport and no one knew what they were talking about because they didn't have the capacity. And she drove her wheelchair at eight miles an hour from the airport to the hotel. And there is I no was never way. so embarrassed in my entire life. And then further to that, 
uh, the hotel gave her two numbers of companies that weren't in operation anymore. So in order to get her to the convention center, we had to get her to wait 30 minutes outside in the freezing cold for public transportation until finally I said, that's it. And I started making the phone calls and getting a company that was adequate to provide transportation. But then there's all these things about, well, we don't, we, our last drop-off is at 8 PM and our, you know, and, um, you know, will the patient, I said, it's not a patient. She's my photographer. She just happens to be in a more like field. Not, not them just saying, not them just uh, allocating illness to this lady. Exactly. She's just trying to live her regular life. A hundred percent. They're like, no patient. Wait, what? And even, I think the most profound message that I heard, you know, that, that we, we were not present to, and it's important was a, uh, when, when we started first hearing about diversity and inclusion, I went to a women's organization here on Long Island and they were talking about our vocabulary and how we talk and how, you know, it's, it's like death by a, by a thousand strikes. You know, it was, uh, it's that, that word you hear when it's like you squint and it's a little here and you, you let it go by and you're like, well, you know what? We can't let it go by anymore. We have to learn to talk to each other. We have to say, you know, what did you exactly mean by that? I did, it didn't sit well with me. And, and let's get on that, that even, heal where we can we can have a safe space to have meaningful conversations and not just wince or or let it go by and that we can learn to talk to one another respectfully and in a manner that that is comfortable and that is that is positive and that takes us to the greatness that we can become by working together yeah it, it it's a it's a whole different ball game when you stop brushing things under the rug right and you start going you start bringing people's attention to it and sometimes they even want to make you feel like you're crazy like no 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 no. this is <laughs> this 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 shouldn't be this shouldn't be like a maybe right like this shouldn't be like a hey we can't hire a service to take my photographer to this event because this this is supposed like we're this we're supposed to have access to this in some way shape or form like where can we get this right like she shouldn't have to sit outside in the cold for 30 minutes either so it's all about like challenging the status quo right to to really think about like how do we like include people not like just like people who we can identify with but just all people right and you know Unique, look at it. It's what an opportunity we have where the whole world got disrupted. I mean, talk about 52 card pickup. <laughs> We're talking about like, like millions of card pickup. Mm -hmm. And we've got a chance to pick up the pieces and assemble our, our culture, our society in a, in a way that that will make us better mm -hmm. that will we solve everything you know probably not but but if we can start if we can start someplace to again be present to understand you know you and i had the conversation earlier about you know diversity and inclusion like what does that mean and who sets the standard and and what is what are the guidelines? And, you know, I, I think they're still being formed. They're still being formed. I, I do know that what will get my vote is, is when we have balanced conversations, because I truly believe that anything that is in too much excess, whether it's good or bad is no good and too much or too little. And, uh, it seems like we always have that way oh got a problem let's go way to the other side or mm -hmm. and it, that doesn't fix it either so it'll require communication in a safe and comfortable way that's authentic 
I think number one, all of that you just said is fair and I appreciate you for sharing it. I think a lot of, I think the reason why things are still being formed, right, is because people aren't reaching out to the people who are actually affected to have their <laughs> voice be a part of the conversation. Like, I have no idea what it's like to be a man. I can't make decisions for a man in an uninformed way. I have to reach out to them, ask real questions, have them be a part of the conversation so that I can make a decision, right? I, sure, I'm, I might be the woman make, but I need to be able to have the right information to make the decisions that actually would help them versus hindering them. Um, so I think that's probably the biggest issue. So slowly but surely. Um, and even even another example of that is uh, I when I, I do a lot of work with the nonprofit organizations on Long Island, and we have an amazing group that uh, that. Does work oh, I think you told me about this. domestic violence, yeah. and you know, and I was talking with someone, and I, I said, you know, I always thought you could put your feet in someone else's shoes, but there's there's boundaries where I don't know what it's like to be in that situation, and I don't understand it but I know it's not right. And if you help me, I can listen and I can learn and I can, I can maybe do something. And uh, you're hundred percent right. hundred percent right. Well, on that note, I'm going to transition a little bit. Uh, I know that you have some events coming up, right? And I want to talk about one specifically, which is uh, Thrive 2023. Um, what is Thrive 2023 and what can attendees expect from the conference and sponsorship expo? So that is May 9th. And I am so proud of um, during the pandemic. I just saw such a mobilization happening amongst business owners and our country depends upon the small businesses. And from coast to coast, it was like shock and awe. It was, oh my gosh, what do I do now? And some people pivoted and started a new business, especially in the trade show industry, because we were completely shut down. All the events completely shut down. Um, and people were like, oh my goodness, you know, I've got people that work for me. I've got, you know, how do we take care of them? And others pivoted. And uh, one of my board members um, had a, a huge facility for um, Pipe and Drape, their show organizers, and they opened up a, a gym. Mm -hmm. uh, now they have two very successful businesses. So they're <laughs> nice. scrambling to try and run two businesses. Um, but others, you know, they maybe changed and did something to make the money to pay the bills or put food on the table, but it's not really what they're liking to do. Mm -hmm. So I realized that I know some brilliant minds in business. And I called 11 of them up and I said, would you work with me to write a book and give some real honest strategies and, and worksheets and, and practical information for small businesses who can read this book and it's a cliff notes, but but get some direction to help them to reimagine, rebuild, and reinvent their businesses so that they can be profitable. And we um, we wrote the book, How to Create Your Future with Confidence, and it's a step by step uh, guide to help people reimagine, reinvent, and rebuild their bit a profitable business. And these authors are coming to the Melville Marriott on Long Island and doing workshops with small businesses uh, on the night. There'll be morning sessions and afternoon sessions. And we have some keynotes 
Uh, we have some experts in mergers and acquisitions uh, and uh, creating uh, plans for, um, for the sale of a business. Uh, we also have um, one of the, the preeminent leaders on Long Island, Jamie Austin, who uh, has put together uh, professional services partners. He'll be uh, talking about the partnership program and being able to be a resource for small businesses on things that they need. Because how many times have we picked someone that we thought was going to help us because they said they could solve the problem only to find out that we were a little bit lighter in our wallet and our problem still was in the same place that we left it. Yeah. These are resources that are time tested, that are uh, that are evaluated, that are peer reviewed. Um, and so the day will include resources. It'll include education. It'll inc include actionable takeaways. And it will include uh, a sponsor showcase so that people can come and network and meet some uh, good um companies that are that are providing goods and services that businesses need to advance okay I love all of that like all of that sounds like super exciting so selfishly right I want uh to get some previews of like what the content is going to be like right so like can you share some tips on how an event professional can reimagine redefine and rebuild a profitable business so one of the authors is the former global chair of the Institute of Management Accountants, mm -hmm. and he talks about strategy, and he also talks about balanced scorecards. So when you're developing your plans, that you are able to implement a system that allows you to create a very easy scorecard using the symbols in a stoplight the green, the red, and the yellow, so that you don't uh, use your time on things that are going well, that you're focusing on things that are critical or that might require some crisis management. And then those things that maybe are getting into that yellow zone that you need to uh, start to do some uh, proactive uh, repair on. Um Another one of our uh, authors is a is an expert in turnaround management. So how are you, you know, so let's, let's we might be in a situation where day to day we are back in the space of having a profitable job and maybe having a profitable quarter. But what does our balance sheet look like? And how much money did we take out in loans, whether they were the idle loans or whether you're using credit cards or or any other form of uh, to keep your cash flow going? You know, what does that look like? And, and what are the important things that you need to look at like so that you don't go running down the road and next thing you know, you fall into a pothole? Uh, so again, actionable items on what to look for in your financial reporting. Bill Corbett, third, uh, second generation uh, PR and communications. You know, what does that landscape look and how has it been affected by social media? You know, one of the things that I think is brilliant, uh, later this week, I'm going into a LinkedIn meetup. So it's actually connecting people on LinkedIn to go to a face-to-face -face event mm -hmm. at Drake Studios. So what are these types of things that we can use to take us from this disruptive stage into uh, the limelight? How can we shine the light using public relations, marketing communications? How are How can we take this Rubik's cube of tools and create the right combination to win. And then uh, and then more so is relationships. You know, how are we going to network? How are we going to build relationships? How do we become uh, selective 
in the relationships that we have with people and and how do we create ambassadors for our business? How do we um, get into something, give enough repeat impressions so that that people will remember us? You know, look at all of these companies that are now having a remote employee workforce. Well, has are we measuring what that impact is on not having that logo on the exterior sign of a building on Route 110 that's getting tens of thousands of impressions every single day, 365 days of the year? Are we turning our staff into, into ambassadors? And are we creating our company culture in their remote office environment. So one of the things that my designer and I are working on is creating branded workplace tools like the stapler, like the like the pens, like the the desk mats, like the um you know the various different tools that are on your desk mm -hmm. to reinforce your corporate brand and, and maintaining loyalty and maintaining the the ambassador uh, ship quality of our of our workforces. You know, we have to. We can't just go remote and think that there's no there's no reaction to that. You know, every action is a reaction. So we have to kind of look a little bit forward, and those types of information will be brought up on that day uh, in that book with speaking to people about. You know, okay, you you gave up your office. No. What did now what? Mm -hmm. Okay, you your employees are working remote. Now what? Mm -hmm. What is the why? You know, the first thing when when you going back to those virtual events when they first came out, everybody got so focused on the technology they forgot about the why. Why does their sponsor want to invest in them? Why does their customer want to attend? Why? It, why? It, what is their mission for this particular event? And so we've got to get back into that real meaningful uh, evaluation. Well, Laura, I feel like this was, this in itself was a really meaningful conversation. I feel like people would really learn a lot from it. Um, can you tell uh, the listeners where to find out more about you, your work and um, your upcoming projects? So my biggest presence is on LinkedIn. And, uh, I, <laughs> I'm not, I'm I know that I should be Instagram and I know, but I'm, I'm getting there. I'm, I'm, uh, I have a should face, but the easiest way um, to find me is on LinkedIn and that's Laura Palker and it's P-A-L-K-E-R. And please reach out, but be sure to say that, you know, unique, yeah. um, and because I'm really careful, I have I have over 2,500 um, personal connections, and I protect them like a mama bear. <laughs> and um, the other thing is, um, you can always reach me by my email, and that's l palker. That's p a l k e r at t s solution center dot com, and solution is singular. And you can always visit us on our website at TS, that's Tom Sally, solutioncenter.com. Thank you so much, Laura. I mean, all of that will be in the show notes for sure. Uh, so you guys feel free to look out for it. But I, I really want to circle back to this. I know you said it and I was supposed to let it go. But why why does your biggest presence have to be on um, Instagram? I'm curious because you're a very like B2B oriented kind of person, like in terms of like your how your businesses function. So talk to me about why you want to make that transition. So I'm not sure if it's a transition, but more of a balance okay. back to that, that, that stage is that, um, you know, LinkedIn, it was comfortable for me. It was in that, that B2B world. Um, when Twitter got all funky and crazy, I, I boycotted that. <laughs> so, um, but we're, I'm, I'm ready to get, to get back and try. Um, Instagram seems to have such a a robust 
um, uh, presence, but the information and the visual communications, I think will be good in being able to demonstrate some of our work. We actually built a brand new 20 by 20 that was for sure the best booth on the show floor. Right. And we're building a new 30 by 40 uh, foot exhibit that again, there's nothing on the show floor like it. So to be able to um, let us demonstrate uh, how we can be cost effective, efficient, effective, but really truly unique to highlight the brands that we that we work for is exciting. And um, so I think that uh, get, giving us a little bit more balance and uh, Facebook is is certainly um, stepping into some new new worlds and new functionality. So mm -hmm. you know it's an ever it's an ever changing landscape. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, done with my curious behind, you know. <laughs> um, thank you so much for your time, Laura. Always lovely speaking with you. And I will see you around. Thank you so much, Unique. I'm looking forward to seeing this, this uh, podcast and hope to share it around the world. Sounds like a plan. And that's a wrap for this episode of Aventus 365. We hope you enjoyed listening and learning something new today. If you enjoy the show, please leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform to help event professionals discover us. Don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode and sign up for our newsletter for behind the scenes content and updates on upcoming events. If you have any suggestions for future topics or guests, or just want to say hello, you can reach us at info at eventus365.com. We love hearing from our listeners. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll see you next time on Aventus 365.